<clears throat> right, this next fatigue problem is similar to the previous in terms of the, both the geometry and the loading. We have a, a bolt, single bolt loaded purely in tension. Uh, it's a fluctuating load from zero to a maximum. So loading is very similar. The main difference here is how we're going to calculate the endurance limit. And I'm also going to calculate the stiffness constant in a different way that we haven't seen yet. Uh, since it does have cut threads, as you can see in the diagram, well, we can't use the endurance limits listed in the table, so we're going to have to calculate this manually. And how to include that, the, uh, the stress concentration from that table, which is about 3.8, uh, it's a little bit unique for bolt problems, so pay attention to that. All right, so there's just the basic problem statement rewritten, what we're working towards there. Uh, and the very first thing I'm going to do is actually calculate the endurance limit. This is done essentially uh, as we've done in, uh, well, just back in the fatigue portion of 4010, even. There's nothing particularly unique about it. We can include KA. Um, and let me give you the value 7592 for bolts that are cut. That cutting is a machining process, so we use the machine surface finish. You can grind threads, it's a possibility, but if nothing is stated otherwise, you can assume that's machine. Uh, for just a pure axial load, KB is 1.0. Oops, KC. Really hard to erase on this one. Um, for an axial load, this is .85. KD, we're just going to assume it's room temperature, so that makes that 1. And the endurance. I'm going to assume 99%. That would often be listed in the tables. Uh, just remember with that, if you assume 1 for that, you're not assuming any sort of nominal condition. You're assuming 50% reliability, which for our mechanical design is pretty horrendous. So that is uh, you know, 99%, 99.9, something like that as a general value is, is a much stronger assumption than 1. So I'm going to write this out. Now, here's the difference. is I'm going to take that, that KF factor and include it right here. That is, I'm including it on the endurance limit itself. I'm not going to include it as a multiple to stresses. You could include it as a multiple to stress, but what you would do then is only include it on the alternating stress. This is a typical design choice for analyzing bolts, is to assume that stress concentrations and fatigue affect the alternating stress. And you can do that either way. You can multiply sigma A by uh, KF, or you can divide the endurance limit by it. And the fact, the fact is it doesn't matter. But in solving this problem, ultimately, I'm going to use the form of the uh, the uh, factor of safety equation where I don't manually calculate the alternating stress. So to me it's easier to divide the endurance limit by the 3.8 and carry out the calculations that way. And when I do that I get 8.294. Compared to the ultimate strength, the proof strength, the yield strength, anything of the sort, that's a very low number uh, due in large part to a high stress concentration. Alright, the next thing I'm going to do is the stiffness constant. Now what I'm going to do here is we know that C is KB over KB plus KM. <clears throat> But if the, the members being clamped and the bolt are made of the same materials, this is equivalent as saying the area of the bolt divided by the area of the bolt plus the area of the joint.
And this is just a different way of going about it. Calculating the area of the bolt is trivial. We're going to assume that the bolt's fully threaded right up to the nut, so that's based on the full diameter, which is to say AB is just pi over 4 times 1 half squared, which is dot 1963, which is squared. Now the area of the joint, AM or AC, again, I'm kind of C and M are, are interchangeable between uh, textbooks. We'll call it AC here. That's area of the joint. Actually, I'll just, there we go. Cover both our bases. Um, this, this is a form of an equation that I'm not sure if it's given in Shigley's or not, but that doesn't make it any less valid. This is just another approximation that can be used for calculating joint stiffnesses. G is the gauge length, which is given in the problem as 2 inches. And that 30 degrees, that is, if you remember that trapezoid that the stiffness equations in Shigley's based on, it's a 30 degree angle, included angle in the trapezoid. So we've got everything here to calculate that. D is a half, and that G is 2 inches as given in the problem statement. So we can calculate AM from that, and it comes out to about 1.187 inches squared. And finally, we'll calculate C as dot 1.963 over dot 1.963 plus 1.187, and that gives us, where did it go, dot 1.419. which is a little bit lower than some of our for other calculations for C, but it's not terribly surprising. Uh, you've got a very thick steel member, but also a fairly large steel bolt. And interestingly, if I calculate that with um, the standard method of treating the joint as a, as a steel plate and using the exponential equation with those factors A and B, um, I get about dot one seven, which is a little bit higher, but you know, these are approximations. So whichever one you go with, um, you're getting in the right the right zone with the value. So I'm going to use this one since we've, we've already calculated it. All right, so this is asking for uh, what's the maximum Fmax if there's no initial tension and if the bolt is initially installed at the full proof load. So first part of that, which well, instead of saying no initial tension, we'll just call it what it is. Fi is equal to zero. There's actually a particular equation given in the text for this situation, and it's NFO, or zero, where zero is the preload. If there is no preload in a joint, then as you apply external force, all of that external force has got to go into the bolt. This C factor in the, uh, the bolt stress, or bolt force equations for FB and FM, those assume that there's initial compression in the joint. If there's not, just statically, all of that external force has to go into the bolt. There's just there's no, no exception to that. That's the statics of it. So uh, what we're setting up here is if there's no initial tension, as a result of that, it's a little bit of a different formula. I'm going to use a factor of safety as one once again of our endurance limit, our ultimate strength, or tensile area. F max, which is what we're shooting for. And then SUT plus SE. Out of that we get twenty two thousand and two pound force. Um, one thing I'll point out, in calculating the stiffness, I assume that the bolt diameter was full right up to the threads, but here I'm using AT uh, very clearly. Let me just bounce back to the problem statement and try to make clear why that is. Even if I'm assuming that the threads stop right at this flange, they're still immediately below that flange. There has to be a thread loaded in tension. So the weakest part of this bolt will be that very first thread. That's where we're calculating stresses. So that assumption that the, the threads stop right at the edge here, that only influences the stiffness. It does not influence where you calculate stresses, which has to be at that first thread.
All right, now part B of this is what if the bolt is loaded to its full proof strength? And if we were in class right now, I'd pause here and take a poll as to whether you think this number would go up or down. Uh, and that, at, at a glance, it seems like, well, you're putting more force into the bolt initially with an initial force. Um, you might expect that the, the working strength goes down, but let's see what actually happens. So if I'm loading to full uh, proof strength, this will be 1 times SP, which is 85,000, times AT, which is .1419. That is 12,060. And now <clears throat> we don't need anything else. We can go straight to the equation to calculate the factor of safety, including that initial force right there. Still equal to 1. And there we go. I'm solving for F max now. Yep. 4,527. So what's happening with this in this initial case, if there's no initial tension in the bolt, I've got a plate, I've got a bolt, and as I load this externally with force F, all of that goes straight into the bolt. Every bit of it. But down here when I have a preload, same bolt, same force F. The force in that bolt now, C times P, plus that initial force. Or it should be C times F there. F or P, same difference. So even though you're starting with a, an initial force, what you're actually applying initially from that external force is a fraction of the full force. If there's no initial tension, it all goes straight into it. But if there is initial force in the bolt, then all you're applying of that external force is C, which is, what is it here, 14%. So that's a huge difference. Um, the rest of that force is going into relieving compression in the joint. That's, that's what the advantage is, not only to preloading a bolt, but to preloading bolts to proper expected values, because it gives you a great deal of control over the strength of the bolt, both statically and in fatigue.